Reese knew. Yeah, it was yesterday, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I had I had trouble finding that. I found it on YouTube before I found it on the JPL or NASA site. Yeah. That yeah, was their site. Their site is really big. Yeah. Now it was it was that video was just remarkable because they had you know they could look up or down or whatever and yeah. they had a high resolution and you know I, I was just totally amazing. Yeah, I think the whole process of landing on Mars is amazing. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really incredible, and and the success rate. You know, it's been remarkable for yes, for yes, the U.S. Yes. Yeah. Do you guys know? I haven't looked it up. Did they come straight in from orbit? You know, just straight yes. into Mars, or did they? They did. No, there, there was no transitional orbit. Okay. I was they wondering. headed for Mars and they they aimed for the uh, top of the atmosphere and they just skidded in. Yeah. Wow. At the right angle. So, Dick Beam, <laughs> you're you're sharing your screen right now. I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> and I and I I can stop doing that anytime. I, I guess that's what I'm doing right there. Oh, you're sharing your screen. I can stop sharing. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So you, you're you're looking for your Tim. okay. There we go. <laughs> Sorry hey, about Tim. That. Hi. Oh hi, Tim. So I think we're Hopefully, could I have more, a couple more people remember to check in? <coughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Need, need to send electrical pulse out there to wake people up. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, did you work on your mirror at all past week? I, I got a, uh, you know, I, I got, I'm guilty of, of, of not doing it one more time. And it, it's, uh, you know, I have this guitar project that's just taking me by storm all the time. So I'm neglecting my duties of doing this. But I will say that I found my notes that Tom uh, made for me on the, uh, uh, you know, the zones that I need to enter into that software uh, that Rifki made. And so I found all the pin, the pin settings. But beyond that, the thing that's most interesting is see, I don't really know how to do that. All you guys, you know, Jerry and Tom knows how to do this, but he wrote, he, he wrote, he did some, some math on the, the different zones. I'm not, and in, in particular, mine are the 95 zone, 84 zone, 70 zone. Now the 70 zone is exactly halfway between the center of a mirror and the outer edge. That's the 70 zone. So when you, when you, take measurements at all these different zones using a pin stick, which is just nothing more than a stick that has toothpicks uh, that, are, that are set down. And you can actually move a donut of light over each one of those pins and take a, 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 and take a, a, a measurements. And then with, the, with those measurements, you get an idea of what your wave fund is. But the interesting thing that Tom did with this math is that he showed to my amazement, that between each different zone, like between the, you know, I think it would be equivalent to like 90 zone, 80 zone, 70 zone, 50 zone. But he, in particular, he accurately put them at 95 zone. It's 95% of the, the light collected is in 95% of the mirror. And then 84% of the light collected is in the 84 zone. And in the difference in the measurements between each one of those zones is exactly 0 0.019 inch. And that to me was just completely, I, I couldn't believe that was, could happen with a parabola, but he showed it to me in math and he just, he did the math right in front of me. And I found all those notes on that. Okay. It's absolutely, it's fabulous. So uh, 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 what, what, I'm, what I'm doing is uh, I'm taking uh, a tripod that his friend that died, Tom Mudd, he, he gave me an old tripod that had the, he had the crank center, uh, the, the center pole that would crank up or down. And I, I, took a, I took a sheet of plywood and put a screw insert so that I could put my tester on it. So now instead of setting all this stuff up in the house, I can go to different locations where it's dark enough and I can set this platform down and put the tester on it. And now I can now at least I have a chance of doing some dark testing 
uh, it, it's going to be a real trial for me to to try and do this with this COVID going on. It's 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 usually something I did with the with the workshop guys and all the experts. You know, Jerry, Tom, th those guys they, they know what they're doing. And and uh, when when we were taking these measurements, and of course when Mike was around, it was great. When 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 Mike was around, he had that really fancy tester that he made. You remember that, Tom? Mm -hmm. he, he had he had all the gizmos on it you could have, but. In particular, every time I went to the workshop and you guys took measurements, I had a tester there that was fairly easy to read. This one I made was the first tester I made, and it's just not that great. Uh, so, you know, I'm getting, um, I'm getting, you know, it's really difficult for me to pick up for some reason on this eight inch mirror, that donut of light, every time I move the platform in or back, there's a little donut of, of a shadow that it looks like a ripple of a shadow that moves inward or outward, depending on moving forward with your platform or back out. And you put that little shadow right over one of these uh, toothpicks and take a measurement. And then uh, using that basic formula, what is it, R, R squared over 2R, <clears throat> where R, R is the ra little R is the radius of the, of the uh, mirror, and big R is the radius of curvature. So it's R squared over 2R. And that tells you really the depth of the mirror at any point from the center out to the edge on that parabola. And you take those measurements and the difference in those measurements gives you the quality of the wave front. So that's what I'm after. And uh, it's just a matter of time, you know, getting through some of the car and getting to where I can put this thing in a room that's dark enough and try to tune that damn tester so I can get some of these measurements. Uh, I don't know what else I could do except, you know, maybe borrow the tester from Tom uh, Whittemore. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's a bummer not to have the people around there that can take a look at it and then they can try to move that, you know, try to move that, uh, that knife in, move the platform in and out. And uh, it kind of, it's kind of a collaborative effort in a way. I, I really appreciate that. So, um, and that's it for me. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this thing from Bob tonight. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be really cool. So, uh, I'll, I'll lay back and just kind of cool my jets. Well, we got 10 minutes. We got 740 right now. So I don't see anybody else popping up. So well, let's get going with Bob then. Yeah. Sounds good. You can share your screen, Bob, to us. Put yeah. I will. Uh, Everybody might want to go to speaker view. Yeah, go to speaker view. Cause I have some introductory things I want to say before I show the images. And then I'll uh, do some screen sharing and hope that everything goes well. Um, I, uh, I've i really enjoyed dropping in and being with you in these meetings. Uh, I really miss the AU. Um, I haven't made a lot of effort to get reinvolved with a group here because there's nothing really that close to us here. So I figure it's a lot easier to do what I'm doing with you guys to get on Zoom. And I know most of you and uh, and uh, have some really, really good memories of the AU. So I'm really glad, you know, we can do this. Uh, yeah, well, what I want to talk about tonight is I just want to share with you a couple decades worth of experiences of trying to do lunar and planetary digital astrophotography. Um, years ago when I was in high school, I got started in this, as I shared uh, at one of our meetings from years ago, when I was in high school, I was taking uh, pictures through a scope, uh, actually with a 12 inch scope that I had made and trying to photograph the moon on film. And uh, that, that, in those days, to get anything decent, you had to have a dark room. And uh, when the digital cameras came along, all of that radically changed. And that's really where uh, my interest took off. And uh, some of what I'll be uh, sharing with you this evening, for some of you, it will kind of be old hat. So uh, if it's repetitive, I apologize. For some of you, it may be new. I will try to share that which I think is interesting to the greatest number of people. Um, the, um, I think that 
the most important thing in getting to any form of astrophotography is that you take a hands-on experimental perspective. I mean, you can sit and read and read and read and try to digest all this information, but where you really learn is getting out with a telescope, getting your equipment set up and start taking pictures one after another after another and begin to learn what works and what doesn't work with your setup. Um, so I'm a very hands-on person when it comes to that. And I developed a certain uh, protocols that work for me and they're certainly not written in stone. I'll share some of that with you. Uh, now the pictures um, I'll be showing you um, uh, come from Santa Barbara and Scottsdale. And um, people do ask me, well, what's the difference uh, between trying to do planetary work in Scottsdale versus Santa Barbara? Well, um, Santa Barbara, my location in Santa Barbara is only a few miles. Well, it's probably less, actually a mile, Just probably only a few Yeah. Hi, John. Hi. Hello. Hey, Tim. How you doing? Good, good. We're, we're, we're hey. getting into Bob's uh, uh, introdu introduction to lunar and planetary astrophotography here. Okay, I do not want to interrupt. I'll let Dr. Bob talk. And that, that reminds okay. me, folks, if, if you want to put your uh, microphone on mute, that might be a that might be a way to go. Unless Bob, you if you want to keep it open for questions while you're talking. Okay. Yes, that that's a good point. Um, uh, you can certainly ask me questions at any time as we go along. Uh, just just uh, you can just raise your hand and, and let me know that you by that way that you got a question, <laughs> and uh, I'll do my best to uh, you know to answer it. Um, the in my Santa Barbara location uh, was only a mile probably from the beach. And so, uh, as you all know, you deal with uh, clouds coming in at night, overcast, uh, current currents, and uh, that certainly would interfere with the scene, good scene. Here in Arizona, we don't have that. Uh, we don't have dew either. So uh, what we have is a much more stable atmosphere, which is uh, more conducive to high resolution planetary and lunar photography. Um, by the way, while we're talking about Santa Barbara, I want to pass on a hint to you that worked really well for me in terms of ascertaining the kind of atmosphere we'd be having and I'd look for. And I would go to the... Uh, it was the uh, Goes West satellite with a visible image, which would show the clouds offshore. And uh, I found that whenever the clouds were behind, that is, uh, it'd be to the west of the islands, that I would be in pretty good shape, probably up to midnight. If there were any clouds that were between the islands and Santa Barbara, forget it. I just never would go out because I know, knew that about nine o'clock or so we would be clouded in. Anyway, I pass that along because that was um, a really uh, cool way and pretty predictable way of um, forecasting what the clouds would do uh, in, in that area, which I know is it's it's a challenge. Um, so. Um, while we're talking about uh, seeing, as most of you are, I'm sure aware of, is that uh, a greater aperture brings greater brightness and resolution always. But of course, the caveat to that is that the greater the aperture, the fewer times the telescope will be able to reach theoretical resolution. Uh, in other words, if you have a 14 inch celestron, as Christopher Goh has, uh, you're going to get incredible resolution with that. Uh, but unless you're in an area of very good scene, uh, you know, very good to excellent scene, 
there are not going to be too many nights of the year that you're going to be able to see uh, the planet planets in that kind of detail. So uh, I think that for most of us where we're living, particularly in Santa Barbara, that uh, probably apertures between six and 12 inches work best uh, in average to good seeing locations because of the way of the size of the cells relative to the aperture, the temperature cells. So um, I, I think it's just encouraging for you to know that even though you don't have a, a really a, a large scope, you can still get some very good images. Um, now the telescopes that I used uh, that you'll see uh, these images, um, for almost 15 years, I used uh, the original Celestron 11 Next Star. Uh, that was originally produced about in 2001. And, um, and so uh, that, that telescope I used for a very, very long time. I currently have a C11 Edge. And um, when it comes to mountings, um, the C11 next star came with a yoke mounted out Osmuth mounting. And um, I later put it on a, an equatorial wedge. Um, my current scope is on an Ioptron CEM60 uh, equatorial mounting, which is really a beautiful mounting. I mean, it's, uh, it's exquisite in, in several ways. Um, obviously, the mountings that you use are going to need to be uh, really rigid and stable. Um, Altosmuth mountings can be used for lunar and planetary photography as long as you have very short total exposure times because uh, at high resolution, the rotation of the image is going to be really apparent quickly. So an, an equatorial mounting is really uh, preferable uh, to use. Now the imaging hardware that I used, um, the, I use the primary F10 focus for all the work you'll see here. And to get really good imaging, um, I use a two, power or two and a half power or three power barrel lens lens. And uh, excuse, excuse me, just a minute. I, I'm got to say something to, to Jackie here. So um, so in most all cases, the image was um, was increased from F10. Uh, in addition to Barlow's, you can use uh, eyepiece projection. And I don't know if any of you have ever used eyepiece projection. It's not as common today uh, as it was in the past. But eyepiece projection is you put the eyepiece into a, a holder and you project the image uh, directly onto the camera's detector. So you get this enlarged image. It's enlarged according to how distant or close the eyepiece is to the detector. <clears throat> but I took some like that. I'll mention as we go along. Um, Bob, is that also known as afocal? The afocal method, or is it different? No, afocal is it's where you put the the camera lens right up to the to the lens of the eyepiece. Okay. That's what I did uh, in my earliest, uh, actually before I got into it, uh, you know, about, you know, 20 years ago, I was using that. This is what I did when I was uh, in, back in high school, I used afocal. Um, eyepiece projection actually projects an image from the eyepiece onto the, uh, yes, onto the detector. Jerry, yeah. Yeah. Um, eyepiece or a focal is where you set the telescope. Um, you're you're right what you said, but there's a different a 
different way to visualize it is to, you set the telescope so it, it doesn't produce an image. The light comes out of the eyepiece parallel. And then you mm. set your camera on infinity, which is like parallel light coming in and you can just move it up to the eyepiece and then the camera lens will do the focusing. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate, I mean, please jump in with any uh, information you have, you know, that can refine what we're saying here. Um, it, it's a big area and some of you have experiences that be very valuable to share. Um, uh, one thing I found I would highly recommend if you want to really do good uh, lunar and contract photographer is an, an electric focuser. I have found that to be extremely valuable because you can do gross focusing manually with, with the telescope, with your manual focuser, but the electric focuser, then you can fine tune it without touching the instrument. And you can use very, very fine tuning and uh, you can bring it to a very, very, very sharp focus, which is very hard to do when you're doing manually because no matter how you try, you're going to jiggle the telescope. <laughs> so the, the electric focuser, it really is helpful. Um, the um, cameras that I've used, uh, I use primarily uh, Canon DSLR, the Rebel series. And I started out with the XT and I ended up with the, uh, it's a 5.2i. I use a T2i for most um, now there is a, there are some software items here that are really helpful and I would highly recommend that these, you download these to your computer. Um, of course, Registax 6, uh, has been around for a while and it is a great, uh, stacking, um, uh, option for high resolution images, especially those taken, you know, using video cameras. And uh, there is a, there is also a, a German, um, I don't know if it's German now, but there's another similar, maybe some of you can remind me of the name, uh, Astro something, there's another. Auto, Auto Stackert. Yeah, Auto Stackert. So that, that um, maybe some of you, I have not used auto stacker, so I'm not familiar with it, but, but that, may be, um, that may be a good alternative. So have you used it, Chuck? Have you actually used it? I downloaded it, but have never used it. Never used it. Okay. All right. Did anybody use it? Yes, I have used it. I've what used do you it. think? Uh, it, it worked uh, pretty well. I tried Registax, but I, I thought it was kind of too hard. But uh, AutoStack, because it has more features, AutoStack is yeah. really easy to use, and you can load a .mov file. I think or an AVI. I, my my LTAC, AVI is using yeah. Yeah, one of the two, and it, it was yeah. loading it, and it uh, yeah, it did a good job, and uh, it, it yeah. sorts everything. It shows a curve that the, of the quality of everything and so on. But yeah. I don't have much experience. I've only done it once, so please go on. <laughs> okay, well, AVI, yeah, usually the. AVI is the video uh, format, but I've used uh, JPEGs with it. Uh, I've just manually inserted them and uh, stacked them with Registax with great success. So um, you can do that too. You don't have to use AVI. Um, the cameras that I use, um, as I mentioned, the DSL Rebel, and then the other camera that I'm using mainly uh, Nowadays, just within the last couple of years, is a ZWO the video camera, planetary camera. And uh, later on, I can give you the exact model number. And uh, so that, <clears throat> that combined with <clears throat> um, Registax, it's really been amazing. Very quickly puts together <laughs> the best images you have. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, another thing I'm going to mention that maybe none of you have heard of, 
called Astrophotography Tool. Have you heard of Astrophotography Tool? No. Okay, Bob has. Have you used it, Bob? No, it's, um, I, I want to look into it. Um, there's a guy online, the um, Trevor Jones, the guy who does Astro Backyard, uses that a lot. Um, I, I've gone down the path of you know, multiple tools. I was going to look into Nina, 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 whatever it is next. Hank had recommended that. But um, anyway, Astro Photography Tool is supposed to be really, really pretty good. Yeah. <clears throat> um where it shines is using it with a DSLR. It is, um, it is created to match almost every DSLR that's out there and it's being continually updated. So even with the new cameras, new cameras work with it. And so with the digital photography tool, you can use a DSLR to take multiple uh, high-speed images, you can enlarge them, you know, you can either use a, um, either use a, uh, well, uh, you can use a, uh, what I want to say here, a Barlow lens, or you can um, use the, in, in the built-in electronic magnifier. So, um, in any case, it produces really nice images with a DSLR. I'll show you some, we'll, we'll look at those. Um, the other uh, tool I mentioned here is uh, Sharp Cap, which I use with the ZWO, which is a really great uh, downloading uh, software. And then I finish things off with Adobe Photoshop Elements. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have the Photoshop whole Photoshop. Um, actually, <clears throat> if you study elements, it has about 90% of what Photoshop has for a fraction of the cost. So uh, I think you would find it really, really helpful um, to do some of your finish up work. Okay, I'm going to share some photos here. Um, Let's see what we can get going. Okay, you all see this? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, got it. Okay, yep. oh, the moon, okay. <clears throat> um, and I can, uh, I can zoom it up. Um, this is the half moon. Uh, this was taken, this is actually my first attempt at really getting a decent lunar, fo lunar photograph. This was taken um, on, uh, the date here is uh, January 15th, uh, 2008. Uh, and this was taken with my C11 using a um, F6.3, uh, field flattener and focal reducer. And you'll notice that it, it came, I was surprised at how well it came out. I wasn't expecting to be able to get the entire moon. Yeah, that's quite good. Uh, the entire moon like this, mm -hmm. but the 6.3, F6.3 reducer uh, put on the primary focus of the C11 did the trick. So I um, proceeded to take some more images. And uh, so here's one of the, this was taken a few nights later, actually it's in the same sequence. And again, you'll see it really, really got a fair amount of detail. Is that Scottsdale or, or Santa Barbara? No, Santa Barbara. Barbara. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of these, all of these early images I'm showing you is taken from Santa Barbara, yeah from my backyard and where we were living. Okay. Yeah. That's a nice. Yeah. Well, Bob, question for you. The, on yeah. on both, of the, both of these shots, I don't know if that's north or south, but the, uh, the upper part of the limb of the moon, there's a yellowish outline in the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere, depending on which one. It's the upper half. At the limb of the moon, there's almost a, a yellow uh, cast. Up here? Yes. 
in both of the images is that is that something that is caused by uh, some type of a refraction i don't see it in my image okay i don't see that i don't so i don't know if it's an artifact of zoom um, if, and if, you right. back, if you can back out you can see that in the in the lower half you won't see that See how it goes down to about the equator, and there's like kind of a yellowish cast at the outside of the of, of the limb of the moon. Tim, I'm not seeing yellowish in my view. No, You're not either. Sure. Oh, I'll be darn. Maybe, uh, maybe I ought to change my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I mean. <laughs> well, if you move around and it stays in the same place. <laughs> yeah, you're all right. As long as you don't see something moving on the surface. Now, if you see something moving on the surface, Tim, we're in trouble. Okay? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to mute my right. mic. I'm, be, I'm better off muting, muting out here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. I mean, if whatever you guys see and you have any questions, you know, let's do it. Uh, we'll, we'll find out what's going on. Okay, and uh, so now this this one is much more recent. Um, just want to show you uh, here, um, and uh, let's see. I want to be able to get uh, this thing reversed itself on me here. So um, this is um, taken. Uh, I've got this thing shifted up to. Uh, on my screen, things shifted, so it makes it harder for me to engage in, can't get to the zoom. Uh, yeah, I can't get to the zoom. So. Uh, uh, well, this is taken with, uh, I for a while here in Arizona, I used a 9.25 inch Celestron when we were using our home here as a vacation home. And this is just a single shot, which shows you if, if you get things just right, you can get a beautiful picture of the moon in one shot. So this is a single shot, mm -hmm. uh, is what it is. What um, were those other ones? How many frames did you, were they stacked on the other moon pictures? Uh, you know, uh, I don't think so. Mm. Back in those days, I was not very conscientious about putting all the data in. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was just having fun taking pictures. I didn't put in enough. So those are just single frames as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're just single frames. Mm -hmm. I may have taken several of them, but I didn't. I wasn't sophisticated enough then to stack them. Mm. I know I didn't have the stacking software, so they were single frames. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay. I'm trying to disable. Let's see. Hide and hide now. Hide for. Uh, I'm getting Chuck. Okay. Well, I'm reluctant to. Uh, uh, I really would like to get rid of this thing. Anybody got any ideas to take, went to the top, my sharing thing went to the top instead of the bottom. So it's blocking my ability oh, to- Oh, it's blocking the controls. Uh, you could maybe try resizing the window. Maybe that would do it, I don't know. Well, uh, let me try, let me try a new share here. See if it happens. Yeah. Um, bum, 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 bum. Well, Dick, Dick might be right. You could maybe you could do a, instead of full screen, maybe go to a smaller screen size for the window instead of being the full screen size. 
Yeah, one more over. Or yeah, that one there. There you go. Okay. That fits that fits my screen. Is that gonna get you there? No, I can't. I can't uh, down. Uh, well, it still hides the um, controls. The, yeah, the controls. So, um, if you, well, let's. I don't want to spend a lot of time this. We we can see, do most everything with it here. Um, this. Um, Uh, oh, so you you must have photoshopped Jupiter next to the moon there, didn't you? Yeah, I did. That looked neat. I like that. Yeah. Oh wow. Uh, yeah. Well, those are pretty. Well, uh, I gotta get. So, so can you see that now? Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't see you guys, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, this this is a as long as you can see my screen, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, um, this this is an really interesting photograph. Is that um, um, this was taken on Christmas Christmas Day evening, uh, the Moon and Jupiter only two degrees apart, and um, North is up. And what I did was I, I photographed um, using my uh, Pentax telescope piggybacking on the big scope. And I took a picture of the moon and then, uh, then I photoshopped in yeah, Jupiter. Now, um, they are correctly distanced. And so, uh, it, but of course, it would be impossible to get a good picture of Jupiter or the moon would be grossly overexposed. But if you look here, uh, let's take a look closer to Jupiter, and you'll see all four moons, one, two, three, four. That's neat. They're all there. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, that came out really well. I was uh, pleased with how that came out. Um, or you could see. And that's a single shot? Yeah, it's it's a single shot of each one, but then you you, you I I put them together in Photoshop so that okay. but I put them at a the correct angle and the correct distance. Yeah. Boy, the moons came out sharp. Yeah, good. Looks yeah. really good. Yeah, but you had it, different exposure times. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, the moon I had to expose way shorter than Jupiter, of course. No, I came out really well. I was I was very pleased with how that came out. Okay, so <clears throat> this is um, Ptolemaeus Arphonsus. Yeah, object. right. This, yeah. this is one of my early attempts at high resolution lunar photography, and uh, this this was done uh, in two thousand nine. Wow. February of 2009. Of course, in the winter time, the moon is high up in the, in the ecliptic, and uh, so um, I think I think I <coughs> used the eyepiece projection here <coughs> because uh, I was having trouble with uh, the. Uh, <coughs> having trouble getting it up as close as I wanted. So I believe this was, but you know, it was pretty good. It's not as sharp as it might've been. And these, these, are, these are stacked there. These are three 30th second images. And this, this was taken with a DSLR. This was uh, taken with the uh, Canon uh, DSLR XT, the Rebel series. And my, early Canon cameras. <clears throat> now, this was the best shot that I was able to get um, using the Canon camera. And it, 
it really uh, and, and used the astrophotography tool. So I just wanted to show you by using the Canon camera and the astrophotography tool, the kind of resolution that you can get. Um, so if we pull this in, we take a look here. This is really, this is pretty good. Pretty good resolution. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And this was uh, with the astrophotography tool and the Canon camera, I think this was the T2i, I used uh, three 250th second exposures. And these were aligned and stacked using Registacks. And this, this was done in um, 2011. Now, the next one I'll show you is uh, by, for comparison. Um, this one, this was taken with the uh, C11 uh, edge and taken at F10 with the ZWO camera. And it, it mounts to 50 frames. And the 50 frames were sharpened in Registax using Wavelux, which is a great uh, sharpening tool. And it came out with, you can see, incredible, really. Uh, this, this is one of the best resolution pictures that I've ever gotten of the moon. And th this was taken. Now, this was taken here in Arizona. This was taken from the backyard here in Arizona. So um, if you zoom in, you can see a lot of detail here. Yeah, that's nice. And then uh, <clears throat> here's Copernicus. And I'm showing this one because this is, <laughs> this was taken in Santa Barbara. Uh, this is taken on uh, 2011. It is one 320 second uh, ISO 3200 uh, image. It's not stacked. <laughs> I, I lucked out. I mean, I totally lucked out because look, look at the detail. This was taken with the, uh, Canon camera, uh, and um, all right, let me zoom in on it and look at the detail this got. That's very nice. Yeah, it's very that's, nice. That's one shot. <laughs> wow. So uh, you just, I just lucked out on that. <laughs> Do you have a criteria for the number of frames that you stack, or are you looking for a certain number there, or what's good? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Let me, let me, I can answer that. Let me move on to the next frame because uh, that'll uh, be part of my answer here. Okay. Um, okay. Here's Copernicus again. Uh, this was taken uh, uh, last year, in May, using the ZWO camera. And again, uh, let's, let's uh, zoom in. And the level of detail here is pretty phenomenal. Hmm. Um, it almost looks like you're getting ready to land. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, to answer your question, nowadays, um, I'm usually I go anywhere from uh, 50 to 300 frames uh, stacking because uh, using the ZWO you get a video, you actually get a video <clears throat> feed that uh, AVI frames and you feed that into Registax. And what you do with Registax is you go through the series of frames in the uh, video and you select the one that, get one that looks really good, really sharp. And that becomes the master frame against which all other frames are compared. So Registax allows you <clears throat> to take that frame and it selects if you're going to say, well, say you've got a total from the video, you've got like 400 frames and you want to use 100 frames. 
it will select the very best of the frames available to it automatically. And then you start the process of sharpening um, in the internal sharpening program that it has. Um, so nowadays, you know, I'm using a lot of frames because the video camera will supply them. Before I had the video camera, uh, I would um, <clears throat> go through, take a series, uh, like with the astrophotography tool, I take a series of, of pictures that would be saved. I would then go back through them, say maybe I had 50 images. I would go back through them, and these were JPEG uh, images, and I would um, then select out the very best ones, visually do an inspection, select out, put those, I may end up with maybe say, oh, uh, eight to 10, maybe 20, and put those into Registrax and have Registrax stack them. And so I then, because I put them into Registrax already pre-selected, uh, the final image came out pretty well. But uh, don't have to do that anymore, either with the moon or with planets using the ZWO camera. That has just amazingly improved everything <laughs> uh, beyond what I've been able to do before. <clears throat> okay, this, this is an interesting photo. This, this was taken uh, with Bruce Murdoch's eight inch telescope. Uh, Bruce, uh, as you know, Bruce has my uh, 11 inch now. So we kind of swapped off. He gave me, he had two eight inches and he gave me one, which was very kind of him. So I uh, decided to take some photos of the moon with it to see how it would do. And again, this, this is a Plato in the Alpine Valley. Um, and again, it's uh, ends up being uh, pretty clear, but the next, <laughs> This is rather spectacular, this one. It's actually of the same frame, the same picture as before, but it's blown up and of Plato. And, um, and, and I blow this up, look at here. Here are the crater, the cratelets in Plato's floor. Oh very, yeah, very nice. Yeah, see that? You really can see them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's with an eight inch scope. Oh. So as I was saying, you, you don't need a large scope. You can yeah. see a lot You can get a lot of detail. Uh, the eight inch scope and the six inch, six inch scope on the moon is tougher, a little tougher on planets. Okay, so we're gonna leave the moon here and just take uh, a look at some planets. Um, and this is a uh, collage. This is uh, this was taken uh, back. Uh, oh, I don't have a date on it, but it's probably taken back around 2011 or something from Santa Barbara. And this is just a collage of Venus, the two different phases put together to compare the relative sizes. Of course, you know, as as uh, Venus gets into its crescent phase, it gets larger. It's closer to us. So this gives you um, sort of a relative uh, sense of its size. Uh, this is another picture of Venus. Uh, this was taken here in Arizona with the um, my C11 Edge using the um, the ZWO. It's the 290MC camera for those of you who are interested. Uh, it shows up here, right here. Um, so that's the camera that, I, that I'm using. And of course, so, you know, you just, go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering these different cameras, you know, rather than let's say using a DSLR, uh, are there, are there advantages to using these cameras? I mean, is it because of their sensor size or what is it that are, is good? Let's say between them and say a Canon or something like that. Well, the ZWO is designed for planetary work. 
It has a small sensor. Wow. And um, so it doesn't have a very big <laughs> field of view. Okay. But you don't need that, of course, for planets. Sure. It, 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 um, so it, it is superior definitely to the DSLR for planetary work. No question in my mind, it does a better job for lunar and planetary work. What's, uh, what's the ahead. resolution? On, on the video, is it 640 by 480 or is it uh, higher resolution? Um, it's a good question. It depends on the camera and also the frame rate really depends on the camera. And also some of them are cooled, so you can get them down to 35 degrees centigrade below ambient temperature. So you can really cut down on noise. Yeah, this, this is not cooled. And um, I have been, and I don't seem to have much of a noise problem at all with it. I was concerned about that, but it's, it's a really, it's get, uh, before I bought it, I did a lot of uh, researching of reviews and what people thought, and this seemed to be one of the favorite cameras for this type of work. Um, but this is a hundred stacked images. Um, the, the information's up here again. Um, Chuck, I, I have an answer on the ZWO camera he's using. It's a $250 camera shown here on some site, and it's, a, it's 1936 by 1096 resolution. A uh, one thirty one third inch sensor, twelve bit. So it's it's. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. So it's USB and not uh, RCI, uh, you know, RCA video coming in. Right, it's USB. Right, okay. correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. This next is uh, of Mars. Uh, th this. This one was taken uh, in uh, 2018, and when the dust storm was <laughs> beginning to abate, and uh, all of us were really disappointed with that opposition. It, yeah, it was very hard to see anything. You, you can see some detail here in the southern polar cap, and uh, but it again, it, it just it was uh, it was very disappointing. Um, this actually was, was taken with my Canon camera on the astrophotography tool. This is before I had the ZWO camera. Um, the next one, <clears throat> this one was taken just fairly recently. This is of, of Mars, uh, taken on um, November 4th, last year, 2020. And uh, here you see a lot more uh, detail. This is using the ZWO camera. And you can see a fair amount of detail here in the polar cap up here. Um, but this was, it was past opposition um, you know, for a variety of reasons I was unable to. This is, this is also was, uh, taken with a uh, eight inch. This is with Bruce's eight inch telescope, not my C11. Uh, because we moved, we moved into Westminster Village where we are now. Um, I didn't have the ability to set up the telescope easily. So it was easier to set up the eight inch than get the 11 inch. We're working on, we're working on an observatory right now. So as most of you know, and so uh, the observatory has been ordered. So I'm hoping that by the latter part of April, we will have my C11 up and operating in this observatory here at Westminster. Okay. So we go on and take a look at Jupiter. Um, this is probably the best image I've got of Jupiter. Uh, this was taken back in, um, uh, let's see. If on here, I'll guess the date. If it is not on this, but this was taken in Santa Barbara when Jupiter was high in the sky, very different than now. It was up uh, during, I think it was during uh, winter time, and it was a very different position in the sky than where it is now. And I was able to get, you know, as you can see, a lot of detail here, uh, including the red spot. Uh, this is with the C11. 
in Santa Barbara. Now, are you layering different exposures? Because I uh, see it says sixth, seventh, and fiftieth second exposures. I don't. Uh, uh, no, the sixteenth. Uh, that's that's that's, uh, that's just a number of the slide. Oh. Uh, seven. It's seven fiftieth second exposures. So oh, I got you. I got I seven, got and I used the. Um, astrophotography tool to get this and and blew it up I used I used uh, again some of my uh, data has been sloppy here in recording so I, I blew it up so it I think it was I used a uh, Barlow again and blew it up so it's you saw you can see a lot of the festoons and some of the detail here. Um, this is a, a star. This is not one oh, of them. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah that was a, a background star. Okay. Um, some more here of Jupiter. This was um, this was taken here in Arizona with the uh, C11 edge at F10 using ZWO. The problem, of course, that we've all been struggling with uh, this past year is Jupiter and Saturn both are low on the horizon. So this uh, was just up over our house where my telescope was located. This is before we, we moved here to Westminster. So you, again, you can see quite a bit of detail, um, but it's it's not as, it's, if, if this were higher up in the sky, it would be, uh, much more crisp. Okay, this this is uh, <laughs> this goes way back to April of two thousand nine, and it's a collage. And uh, this was actually taken with the C eleven. Short, shortly, I hadn't had it for too long, and I was just beginning to do some planetary stuff. But I, <laughs> I was using a camera I no longer use and haven't used for a long time. <clears throat> it was an Olympus camera uh, that had a built-in magnifier, and uh, you had to, the image had to be displayed on a Cathay Road TV <coughs> screen. And uh, but <laughs> it was an exceptionally steady night, so I got. I think there are a total of three or four images that I manually stacked. I didn't know anything about programs then for stacking. So I manually stacked them. And then <clears throat> several years later, several years later, I got a chance to get Saturn with the same camera, um, almost rings edge on. So then I put them together in this collage. So I came out with this uh, this view, and uh, so <laughs> this shows you what you can do even with not the best equipment. <laughs> now, Bob, I have a question for you. Uh, when, yeah, let's say going back to the the lunar photos. You're, what what really is this is about is aligning the photos when you stack them. Uh, let's say that you took a picture of, I think it was Plato that you took a picture of, and then you took another picture of Plato with even another camera. If you were to stack those two different photos, will, will the stacking software, will it align them and also kind of give you the proper sizing? Are you allowed to do that in the software? No, no. The software uh, isn't going to align stuff that's really different. And okay. or even in the same sequence of images, if they're really different, it won't it won't align them. Uh, they so have to be. Go ahead. It, it's best that you take several pictures uh, in one evening as close together as you can, and then stack those pictures, and and that's the best you should you can come up with. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. What you want to do is take a sequence of pictures all at the same time and save those. And then if you want to take another sequence of pictures, 
do that, or if you want to take a third sequence, you know. Uh, but yeah, the picture should be taken, uh, you know, time-wise, very close together. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There's right. set, up, set up that you can do video. So, I mean, you can get shoot three to four to five minutes of video and you get thousands and thousands of pictures. They say with Jupiter, don't take too long of exposure because it's only an eight hour or, you know, uh, uh, okay. so yeah. So, you know, you, it'll get blurred when you're stacking, but the video thing is great for stacking because, you know, each one's an in, each frame is individual. So. Yeah. Yeah, you know that on the videos, the videos uh, are short. Uh, you can set those at, with your camera, your video camera, and usually they. Uh, I run about five hundred. I take five hundred images, and wow. the, and then uh, the yeah, you know, very short, very very short uh, exposure images, and so then when I go to stack them in Registax. Uh, I tell Registax to only uh, stack the best 100, 200, 300, whatever. And as I said before, I go uh, through uh, some of the, the uh, video ones and, and I select the best one. And that becomes the comparing image that Registax compares everything with. So if I say, if I've got... If I've got uh, 500 images, I'll tell it Registack. I'll tell it to, to stack 400, 400 of the best as compared to this image I select. And so it does it. It selects the 400 that are closest, and then you come out with this image that uses the best. And then you can redo it. Sometimes in some situations. Uh, you don't have to have uh, 400. You might decide you have 200 you're going to snack. And uh, depending on the atmospheric conditions, you have 200, it might be better to, to do that than 400 because um, you're going to pick up mostly the very best ones and the really poor ones, the more of those are going to get left out. So again, you have to experiment. That's why I was saying at the beginning, you really need to just experiment, try out, see what works. And, what and kind of it. sampling are you doing? Are you doing average uh, median stacking? What 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 sort of sampling? Uh, I think it's average. You mean set on 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 Registacks or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, I use. For the planets, they recommend that you use gravity, or I think it's, it's called gravity. It's just one circle. It's not multiple points. Oh, okay. um, That's what they recommend for planets. So that's what I use. On the moon, I use multiple points because there's, there's more uh, detail on the moon. Okay, th this one was taken with my 925-inch <laughs> Celestron. Um, this was taken back in, uh, uh, it looks like uh, 2015. It turned out to be a, a pretty nice image. Um, and that's a good telescope, by the way. Uh, you know, uh, Chuck has an older one, but they're very, uh, they're very portable and uh, it's, it's a good scope. Um, and then this one, Okay, this uh, this was taken uh, with this uh, the C11 Edge with um, back in 2009, and these are 500 stacked images, Ooh, and um, this uh, again this was just using F10 with with. Uh, Occasion, well, I'll show you later with Uranus and Neptune, I had to use a, a Barlow, but generally at the F10 produces a fairly decent sized image. Um, okay, so we'll, we're gonna conclude here. Um, this has gone longer than I thought it was gonna go. Anyway, uh, we'll conclude here uh, with looking at uh, Uranus, and this was uh, taken in 2019 uh, at F25 with the C11 and um, edge. And you can see, pull it up here, you can see, of course, a very distinct 
uh, disc. And there even look like some vague markings here. I couldn't tell whether those are artifacts of where they were true markings or whether they were artifacts of of doing the processing. I, I could probably read. caught some clouds there. Could be, you know, it might be. It, it's just, yeah, I wondered about that, Jerry, because it really, it's just hard to tell. Without without clouds, it's a completely featureless blue disc. Yeah. It's a yellow outline. <laughs> yellow outline. There's a yellow outline. Uh, <laughs> See the yellow outline there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then finally we have uh, Neptune. Wow. And uh, again, Neptune, uh, uh, it looks like Uranus again. Yeah, they're very, they're very similar, except um, Neptune is more blue. Yeah. Compare them side by side. Uranus is, uh, has more blue green. Huh. Uh, coloring, yeah. Is that a star? Is a that a star? This which? Well, there's a put. There's a little blob up there. I guess it's probably in the north. Yeah, yeah, yeah that. Guy. Yeah, yeah, that's a star. Uh huh. Okay. Yep, it's yeah. a star. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If we go back, uh, see the difference of color here. Here's here's oh, yeah. Uh, and here's Uranus. See the difference in color? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it, does, it really does. It shows it. Yeah, pretty clearly. So, okay. Uh, I have photographed every planet except Mercury. I've not photographed Mercury. So, I'm hoping with our new observatory, which has a very good view of the western sky, uh, that I will be able to photograph uh, uh, Mercury. It's on my bucket list, so hopefully okay. we'll get that done. Good. Now I need to get all you guys back so I can see you. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Oh, we got there we go. So Bob, um, Andy Allen, I don't know if you were in the club when he did this, but when he joined the club, he decided he needed a project. And yeah. he decided he was gonna image surface detail on Mercury. Oh, really? And he did it. With, with stacking with a, uh, it was a 10 inch daub that he used. Uh -huh. He said it, the best views he got were during the daytime. Um, because yeah. in the evening it was always close to the horizon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. That makes sense, yeah. Ah, uh, so, okay, I'm gonna stop the, the share here. There we go. All right, so, that's it. <laughs> well, that's very nice. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. If you mind, if you don't mind, I, I have some uh, videos of when I was trying to do planetary. I could share them. It's kind of fun to watch them uh, from the Moon and Saturn, uh, just to get an impression of how you know what the atmosphere is doing to your images. So let me see if I can uh, somehow share that. Um, yes. Good presentation, Bob. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's fun to share this, this stuff, really. So yeah, there we go. Here's an image. <laughs> this is typically what you see. Like um, idea. Yep. The, that's this, good. That's, Thanks, Hank. Yeah, that's typically what you would see. Now, yeah. what was this taken? What what kind of telescope? It was a 10-inch Dobsonian. And uh -huh. the, the camera, this was a focal with an ELF 100 HS taken at 200 hertz. 640 times 480 pixels. Mm -hmm. And I zoomed in optically, uh, probably um, certainly maximum optically. I, I don't know if I did uh, maximum digitally. I think just optically 10 times. Uh -huh. So then you can you get, know, I, this was filling the entire true. view. That's wild. Good. You can see it coming in and out of focus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's typically yeah. what you see. This was yeah, not that's right. that you can get, you have some really good frames in there. You can get your glimpse of yes. little real yeah. brightness in there. If you could so, filter those out, you could stack them and you'd get something comparable to what yeah, I, I, I'll show you, this is what, you, when you stack it, it comes okay. out like this. Oh, wow, yeah. Which is not bad. And yeah. I don't know which movie that was. I had a couple of movies and uh, uh, yeah, it works. Um, 
This was uh, with a very simple handheld um, elf, and uh -huh. I attached it with a, a piece of toilet roll to the the um, uh -huh. piece that was, I believe, nine millimeter or so. That's great. That's meant, that was nine millimeter, and I, with a rubber band. So I, there was like a, I made a little <laughs> gas plastic that was fitting around the ring around the eyepiece, and then I could stick the uh, elf. It's very lightweight on there, and and just mm -hmm. stick it into the the dub. <laughs> So that was kind of cool. Mm. Yeah. And I would like to show you another good. movie of the, of maybe a couple of movies of the, the moon is actually kind of cool too. So here's one. Uh, let's see here. Oh, this AV. Uh, MV. Okay. So here we have uh, the moon. And now you can see mm -hmm. how, the, how it is boiling in, in the atmosphere. This was on a summer night, I think. And I just uh, did not, this is on my DAB, so it was just moving along. And here again, I was zooming. Pink, I think you have to share it again. It, it's Sorry? not showing up here. Oh, well, there it is. It. Yeah. it should be showing up. Yeah, um, yeah, there it is. Yeah, and I've got several of these, but it's kind of it's kind of cool. It's just, I mean, the resolution is not that great, but for a little, uh, you know, handheld camera, it's actually- You can see the atmosphere. Fun. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. like- mm -hmm. A boiling cauldron. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why people have to stack all these images. Um, well, the thing the thing is that the re the thing that Registrax does is, as I said, you select one of the best images, go you know pick out really a uh, sharp one, and then it will match yeah. all the images. So, do you just do that just by looking at it, or are there tools? can use to tell you which ones are the best you can do either uh, way you, uh, it will give you a, a sharpness measure and you can pick say everything that's sharper than a certain boundary layer say 80 percent or you can just uh, pick one that you like from visual huh. that's what i do i just pick one from visual yeah me too now I'm confused with a video like this as it's rolling by. If you're yeah. going to be selecting one part of the image and you want Registack or your stacking software to give you good matches, will it just uh, will it crop out that area of the moon that has those images? Because it's moving. Um, well, no, you have to. You will have to track, and then uh, if you, you use. Yeah. Oh, I see. Use auto, I see. auto stacker. It will just uh, you know stack them automatically and pick the best stuff. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah you have you have to uh, track. Uh, I mean, this is just because the this it looks like you don't have a drive on the DAB here. It's just going. Yeah. No, this was actually yeah. delivered because I I thought it was kind of fun to have it just slide. Oh, yeah. Go see it. <laughs> yeah. It's almost as if you're landing on the moon. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, uh, yeah. Anyway, this, this, was, this is what Joe, Joe used to call this ludicrous power. <laughs> ludicrous power. <laughs> I'm actually kind of curious about the, uh, you know, the, 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 the air bubbles, if that mostly from my, my telescope tube or if it would be from the atmosphere. My, my guess is the atmosphere, but, you know, oh, I have yeah, to say. Yeah. I think it's yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. You can see the picture gets really clear every once in a while, and then it, then it goes back to boiling again. Yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's the way it looks. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, do I see a lunar lander there? <laughs> <laughs> it looked real close when Bob was showing Clavius, but I didn't see the monolith that they showed in two thousand one. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this but is what uh, we should <laughs> we should be able to track this latest rover, shouldn't we? We can just <laughs> photograph in that, get that yeah. really. You know, the, they did take pictures of it from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter as it was landing, so you can see the parachute. Oh, uh, oh uh, I didn't know that. Uh, spacecraft underneath the parachute. Yeah. And and there's also a view from the back shell or whatever showing the the uh, sky crane lowering the uh, the rover. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow! Wow. I yeah, that know. those are amazing photos. Yeah. They're all over YouTube now. Hmm. That's a good photo, Saturn, Hank. It's mm -hmm. Yeah, thank nice. you. Yeah. yeah, very good. Yeah, this, this was really informative. I have, a, I have a couple of pages of notes here for myself. So, you know, what I do have is a, a Rebel camera. That's what I'm going to be going to work with. And, and uh, 
it, as well as just an iPhone. I have an iPhone holder, so I, the the picture behind me in in the uh, in in my picture that was one that I took with an iPhone. Yeah, this here is a time lapse. It was uh, from Medicine Circle, also known as. Uh, it's kind Those of are cool. neat. Yeah, these are cool, kind of cool. This is two and a half hours uh, condensed in like ten yeah. seconds. Or so. But it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's great. I just took one picture per minute for mm -hmm. twenty seconds um, on a just on a tripod, a regular tripod. I have a second one of these, I think, somewhere. Mm. Oh wow! I just got a huge cramp. In my head. <laughs> oh. I'm sitting in an awkward stretch position. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's just a, a hamstring area because I'm I'm in the area that my my legs are all scrunched up. So, but it's yeah. a good area for me. Oh, there's Andromeda. Um, there. <laughs> yeah, there's Andromeda. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I was trying to figure out where it was, but I see Andromeda. a meteor there too. Yeah, it's Andromeda. Yeah. yeah. Hank, what do you do? You do you just open up the camera and let it roll? Yes, basically, yes. Um, so it was a, um, let's see, what camera? Oh, it was probably the Fuji, I think. Yeah, it, it, this was when I had the Fuji. Um, I set it for 20 seconds uh, on a remote timer. So you can just buy those remote timers fairly, you know, for, for 15 bucks, you can get one. And then just- I think I have one of those. And Paul Wynn was the guy that told me to get one of those for a shutter release that you can put, a, it has a timer on it, I think. So uh, yeah. Anyway, that was uh, yeah. So the, the Saturn picture came out. I, I, I've only tried it one time, so this is just a one-time thing. Yeah. You should uh, try it again. Yeah, I, I will. I will, especially when I get my 12-inch Newt and I get this new camera. I mean, can't wait. The nice thing about the Elf, though, is that it can actually take images at 200 hertz, and it's a high-sensitive uh, camera. Mm. What it does not have is. Um, control. So I tried it with Jupiter as well, but that, that just turned into one big white blob. And I, there was no way in which I could adjust the exposure. That's it. Yeah. 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 Saturn worked out better. Yeah. So Bob, are you, are you, Bob? Are you yeah. still updating, updating your website, Bob? Yep. I haven't updated it um, on some of my latest stuff. I got a little bit of updating to do. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, um, yeah, this, this is uh, in the backyard there, uh, with the C11 edge. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I need to do a little, do a little updating and, um, another, yeah, there's a good picture of the, what the scope on the C, CEM 60. Uh, um, was that the dumbbell? Was that the dumbbell nebula? Yeah. Right. At the top. Yeah. It's a dumbbell nebula. Um, but speaking of planetaries, um, I have quite a few images of planetaries. So at some future time, I'd be glad to share those um, and just we can talk about imaging more in deep sky, um, deep sky objects. Yeah. I, oh, this, you got to play this video is really good. I, I like playing your Rhapsody from Space video. That, that's a good sequence of pictures. Yeah, yeah. That, that came out really, the, the way the music worked with the pictures uh, was just totally um, serendipitous. <laughs> it, was, it, it really uh, was. <laughs> Can you guys hear the music? No. Yeah, there it is. You have to turn it way up. I was going to say that's a pretty good Mars, but it's the moon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that's that's the moon in the Pleiades. That was uh, reconstructed. Oh yeah. And uh, these are all images I took and put into this video. Uh, and there's music in the background. Um. I don't hear the music. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Hmm. 
it's it's there, but yeah, barely. Anyway, I put the link for Bob's website in the chat box, so you could you can click on that and and view this over and over again. Cool. Okay, I, I won't spoil it any farther. You got you got to go to that uh, link and probably probably see it on YouTube, maybe. Yeah, it's also on YouTube. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. You, you've got 18 likes here, 19. Everybody make a like on, on YouTube there. Yeah. A few I comments. I haven't been to the YouTube uh, thing for a while, so I don't know how many how many views there are even now. It's, uh, where, where's it show the views here? Let's see. Bottom left, 1994. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Almost 2,000. We need six more views to get to 2,000. Come on, folks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's nice. Is that M13? Yeah. Yeah. And this is 2010. You put this together, Bob, 10 years ago. Yeah, Plus. I know. I know. It's hard to believe how <laughs> much time has passed. <laughs> It's wonderful. I show this on outreaches sometimes, I think. Huh. What's the music? Okay, it's it's um uh, long since I've looked at it. Uh, it says Constance Demby. You yeah, Constance it? Demby, it's but I'm trying to think of the name of the piece. Uh, what's it say there? It says, uh, I forgot the name of it um, now. Well, again, hmm. probably the name of the music is Rhapsody from Space, maybe, huh? Well, maybe, no, yeah. it's it. No, that's my <laughs> that's my moniker for it. But it's uh, Constant Demby. Um, it's from a composition that she did several years ago. Right. And I actually asked her for permission to use the music and she was very kind to uh, grant that to me. Right. Uh, Tom, can you send me the, the link to that YouTube page in an email? Hey, Bob, uh, that, that cone nebula, um, did you use a filter for that or was it just uh -huh. with a DSLR or? Yeah, it was a DSLR. The, okay. these, these, pictures are, okay. these pictures are taken up in Mount Pinos oh, okay. using the F2 configuration wow. uh, a telescope. The C11 is a fabulously um, versatile instrument. So and, you have a hyperstar? Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Um, but I'll be glad to talk more about, I can, you know, I can do some presentations on this stuff. Um, at some later time, and uh, what yeah. did you use to process these images? Well, uh, I used, in this case, I used Deep Sky Stacker, and I used. Uh, I don't use this anymore because I don't do this type of photography anymore. But um, I used that, and I used a uh, gradient exterminator to take care of gradients. The the um, pictures taken at Mount Pinos, where it's so dark and clear, required very little processing. Wow. And the, the F2 uh, configuration uh, is amazing for wide angle. This is an F2. Ooh, I love the terrific. Uh, it's an F2 taken with the F2 configuration. Um, and uh, so I don't, I don't have that this is also F2, Omega Nebula. I don't have that um, lens for my current telescope. It's expensive, 
And uh, the problem here, the downside of living here is the air, the light pollution. We have really mm -hmm. serious, we're Bortle, Bortle 8 uh, rating, you know, serious light pollution problems. It's much worse than Santa Barbara. So, oh, wow. um, hmm. so it, when, when you, when you have this very fast lens, you can quickly get overwhelmed by background light. Uh, but here are the pillars of creation. Uh, you can see them there, zooming in. Uh, Eagle Nebula. Yeah, there it goes. So they, that came out really clear. Again, this was taken from Mount Pinos. Um, so I got some really good. And th this is only 720p resolution, so it's not even uh, the high resolution of today. Yeah. Th and I have a much better picture of the Andromeda Nebula now. Um, much better photograph than that. It's very bluish. I think that was taken with my uh, Pentax camera. Uh, but um, so it's M M eighty one. Oh, M eighty one, eighty two. Yeah. Yeah, and then the uh, ir irregular galaxy down at the lower left. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. See that? Yeah. Yeah. Is that still at the F two configuration, or is that no? Uh, oh. No, th this 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 was probably taken with a it's either the six point three focal reducer. I'm not sure, or it may have gone. I can't remember now. Yeah, I've got that data, but I just don't remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a sunflower. Yeah, so Bob, you could probably time. put Bob, you could probably put that data on YouTube. Put it down below in the description, in a little bit more detail. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, that is on my website. I have these. If you go to my uh, website and go to the deep sky objects, uh, um, I have individual photographs with all that data. That data is all there. Mm -hmm, up to, mm -hmm. uh, you know what I use. So if you go to the website and go to those, um, that part of it where it talks about uh, deep sky beyond the solar system, I guess I call it. Anyway, you can find a lot of that information there <clears throat> in terms of what I did. That's really good stuff, Bob. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank yes, JC. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, these these are the different. Now these, yeah, here, here, all. If you click on these, if you click on these, you'll get information. If you just click on, then it tells you. That's the California Nebula, and uh, that came out really well. I like that. Uh, -huh. uh so all of these, and that's the Pac Man, Pac -Man. Nebula, yeah. and North American Nebula, and mm -hmm. Nebula. So I have information and uh, horse head, horse and flame. And so I have all the information on these pictures mm -hmm. on the website. So if you want to investigate further, you can go there and see it. Yeah. I think we should call it a night. What do you think, Jerry? Yeah, I think so. It's getting close. To yeah. But but yeah. everybody's got to go to YouTube and give give Rob get that he's got to get up to two thousand views so <laughs> go to YouTube. Send me the link. Yeah, hey, I, uh, can I can I just uh, ask one more thing? I don't know if I should bring it up or not, but I understand that Ron Heron is now gone. It, well, will the radio will the radio show still continue? No, the radio show is is kaput. It's gone. Uh, Ron retired from the radio station. Oh. So we may resurrect it as a podcast or as a Zoom meeting that then we would copy to YouTube. Okay. So we're, we're working out the details of that. It, it can, it's contingent upon Tom's being able to educate the Baron in terms of how to use the technology. Oh, okay. Did okay. I get that right? Tom? Yeah, yeah. But and he, I, I, I was hoping that he'd join us tonight, but he, yeah, he must have forgotten or who knows what. But he, he was able to use Zoom pretty well today. So okay. 
So should we plan on doing one this coming Monday? Uh, what time? Well, I, the time doesn't matter. I'll have to write the talking points. How, how so about uh, 11 a.m. or something, a little bit later, to, so you can sleep in? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah? Okay. Even 10 o'clock. Stronger time. Okay. And you'll, send, you'll send a link for that? Uh, yeah. On YouTube well, somewhere. Tim will, Tom will send it. Okay. Okay. I'll get you on there, Tim. And, that sounds uh, cool. So we can do a little of Zoom Gabby, more about astronomy mm -hmm. and space that way. Yeah. Jerry can give us the physics on things because Baron's always asking about the physics of stuff. <coughs> so ho hopefully we'll we'll get that going. Some of the stuff is that it, it, COVID really opened up uh, an area that we weren't even. Uh, uh, it, it was just kind of unintentional, but it worked out really well. We're adapting. What? We're adapting. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's working out really well. I, I think it's kind of cool. And I'll, yeah. I'll keep on working on it. It's too bad that Tom Whittemore showed up so late because I would have really been interested in telling him that I ran across his notes. He, he would have loved that because they were, they were uh, he, he spent a lot of time writing down this stuff about, uh, you know, with testing telescopes, really neat stuff. And uh, maybe I can talk him into to talking about it sometime. So Tim, anyway. what's, ha what's happening with your picture on here? It's like a moon with a bunch of green stuff. Oh, uh, I don't know. You know, it's probably just, uh, I don't know. <laughs> that looks like a little lamp face. One, one, one too many beers, I think. You know? it's, it's, it's pretty yeah. creative. OK. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know what that is. He's uh, got aliens there. What? <laughs> it's not a portal to the fifth dimension. We're okay. Well, that's a that's a really good. That's a I, good know, I think I, I think Tim is using his the camera on the back of his iPad. And oh, so can, you know what? Uh, oh yeah. There he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On, on the upper, I was going to ask you guys on the upper left side of your the screen. There's a picture of a camera with arrows going in a circle. I didn't know what that was. Well, now I do. <laughs> now you do. Oh, you've got an iPad or something. So you were getting a, you were getting a really good look at the desk. <laughs> well, now I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right, it, almost had, it, it almost had a yellow fringe. Yeah. <laughs> well, so everybody, everybody okay to take off? We can see, yeah, see what you have. Yeah. Yeah. Good night, yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank okay you, thanks, everybody. guys. We'll thanks, see you man. later. Right. Stay healthy. See you later. Bye-bye. Stay healthy. In the meeting. See you guys.